part I've creatively called deism part one. To recap, we've said that deism is the belief in God. Deus is Latin for God, and so deism really means Godism. It's a belief in God, but this particular type of belief in God is the idea that God is far off from the world now. He created the world. We believe in a creator God, but he has stepped back and left us to it. So there's, there's never going to be any real revelation of God because God doesn't intervene in the affairs of people. So he's stepped back. He's not part of it. And so you can't know him through any sort of personal relationship or revelation. Um, this is to be completely contrasted with theism, which also means Godism. It's taken the Greek word for God, which is Theus or Theo, um, Theus, Theus, okay. something like yeah, that, that is correct. The, theu means of God. Sorry, um, doesn't really matter about the Greek right now. But um, all I'm saying is, it's it's a little bit weird in that um, both really words, theism and deism kind of mean the same thing if you if you think linguistically they both mean god ism um, but anyway theism believes that god is involved in the world so um, i'm a theist i believe in god and i believe that god is part of our world and involved in it greatly even to the point of saying he's he's involved in my life he's part of my life i'm a theist but um we're talking about deism and so that's the idea that same beliefs about god as his character and personality um, and power and attributes, that's the word I meant by personalities, attributes, um, all involved in that way, all, all agree in that way, um, but he's, he's stepped back. He's, he's like a, a landlord who's gone a long way away and left the tenants, that's us on the world, um, just to get on with it. So um, the first character we looked at last time, this is still recap, is Lord Herbert of Cherbury, and many have referred to him as the father of deism. And he had five ways of, not five waves, five points of talking about how God can be known through reason alone, just by thinking it through. And that's the main way you can know God in deism is through reason, because there's never going to be any revelation. Today, we're going to move a little bit for, further forward and talk about John Locke. John Locke, you've probably heard of him, he's um, a prolific writer and ph philosopher of, of the uh, 1700s and in 1690, um, did I say 1700s? Well yeah maybe, uh, I meant 17th century but we, we're talking 1690 right now and he wrote an essay concerning human understanding, essay concerning human understanding and in that he, he a lot of what goes on there is is natural theology, which is what we're talking about here. Natural theology, knowing God through reason rather than through revelation, um, but specifically deism, thinking about God in that way. So um, he says that reason leads us to the knowledge of this certain and evident truth, that there is an eternal, most powerful and most knowing being. Reason leads us to the knowledge and certain evident truth that there is an eternal, most powerful and most knowing um, being who, who we, we refer to as God. So that's John Locke. And so this writing lays the foundation for uh, a lot of later deism. And all, all this time, really, what we're trying to do as philosophers, or what the philosophers were trying to do in the 1600s, is actually support Christianity and uh, reflects um, a belief in, in the God of the Bible. Um, however, deism does sort of evolve and develop as time goes on, and, and it's, there's, there's more sceptical deism goes later on. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in, in, future, um, in future sessions, but that's John Locke. So what he, what he does is by, say, by saying that, we've, we've got this reason which leads us to the knowledge that there must be a God who's, who's uh, rational and moral. And then we take um, those ideas of being rational and being moral and all the attributes that we can work out that God would have, good attributes of human beings. And we also have a concept of infinity. So we take our concept of infinity and we apply it, we apply it to all the good attributes that we've realised God must have and then we have our complex uh, definition or um, description of, of what God must be like. 
So we take all the moral and rational attributes of God that we can work out exist, and then we multiply them by infinity, and there you've, you've got a pretty good description of God, and you've done all that in your own human thinking. Um, and that was, that's really loch, loch. I want to say loch because uh, I'm thinking of, uh, about um, big lakes in Scotland and, and they're beautiful and I can't help but think about them. It's irrelevant. It's John Loch. Uh, maybe that's how his name should be pronounced. But anyway, forgive me. Uh, and then uh, finally, in this short session, um, in this area, the, the area, in this era, the late 1600s, um, it's worth noting that Isaac Newton um, could be classed alongside this this form of thinking, this this lofty um, confidence in uh, in rational thought that rational thought can do so much for us. Um, this natural theology, this idea, which leads to a, a deistic view of God. Isaac Newton was on board with all of that. Um, now you know Isaac Newton is famous for um, formulating the laws of gravity. Um, he he discovered he discovered the he discovered the um, the, the differential calculus, and um, he, he was probably um, I think guilty of the not guilty. Uh, can't get my words out today. Um, he was probably um, to be attributed to him should be the correct analysis of white light. So he, he's a scientist, is what I'm trying to say, and, and um, a, a well-renowned, well-respected scientist, Isaac Newton. Well, so, um, you know, John Locke and um, these other guys are in good, in good company. Uh, Isaac Newton felt that rational reflection upon phenomena, just thinking clearly about stuff around us in our world, led to the conclusion that, and I quote, there is a being, incorporeal, that means without a body, uh, like um, corp means body, um, so incorporeal means bodiless, um, like, that's, like a corp, that's what a corpse is, it's a body, okay, and just a bit of another linguistic um, piece of information for you. So I'll just start the quote again and, and, and not interrupt myself if I can possibly do that. Um, there is a being, this is um, Isaac Newton speaking now, there is a being incorporeal, living, intelligent, omnipresent. So there's four attributes of this being that he thinks that every human being who's rational should be able to work out exists. There is a being um, incorporeal, living, intelligent, omnipresent. Um, and this sort of comes through quite clearly in 1687, where he publishes his um, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, where he relies heavily on the beauty and, and, and the order in the universe to talk about these things. So, so far we've dealt with or um, had a look at Lord Herbert of Cherbury, who had his five points that you can find out about God just by thinking clearly. We've had John Locke, who says just take moral and rational attributes and multiply them by infinity. And then I've commented on Isaac Newton, who was on board with this way of thinking because he could see that through rational reflection, we could see a being that was incorporeal, living, intelligent and omnipresent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.